You can be doing religious acts and they could be, have been correct two years ago, but they could be totally out of sync with what God is doing in this season. So he says to him, what did he say? He goes, oh guys, you're in the wrong season. It's a season of celebration. He goes, the bridegroom is here. He goes, but when I leave, then the season will change. And then you'll fast then, because later he'll teach when you fast. It's not a teach against fasting. I know people like that not to fast, but it's good to fast. You should fast as a lifestyle. Don't do as events what God wants you to do as a lifestyle. So then he makes this famous statement. He said, new wine is put into new wine skins. By the way, notice in the teaching, he doesn't say that the old wine is obsolete. He just says that the new wineskin, which I want to suggest to you is your mind, is able to hold the old and the new. Well, I know it's good. It gets even better when you read the Bible. So let's start in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. We'll see some fundamental principles here that are really important. One of the things that I will encourage you to do is that when you read scripture, read it and understand that God is expressing to you his heart and his mind. 1 Samuel 2 verse 35 describes God as having a heart and a mind. New King James. When time began, I say when time because in the beginning, how many realize that God has no beginning and God has no end? Now this is where it even gets better. If God has no beginning and no end, which is true, he's the alpha and omega. And he thought about you before the world began. It's possible you've been in God's mind forever. That's how valuable you is. It's not good English, but it's right. It woke some of you up. What? When time began, so the best translation of that, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but we know uh, original language. When time began, God created the heavens and the earth. Notice that heaven and earth are created places. The Lord, God himself, is teaching us something here that's very, very important. Jesus is a king. Jesus is a king who has a kingdom. But he's got it. What is a kingdom? The king's domain. He has to create a domain so he can rule over. So this is what he's doing. And you'll notice here, when time began, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. There's a reason I'm reading that to you. You'll see it here in a moment. But God, Paul will later in the book of Romans will tell us that God calls things be not as though they are. You also notice something else about God. That the spirit of God is there. But unless there is a declaration of what is on God's heart and mind, it does not come to pass. So words, and actually the word that he releases there is himself into the world. In the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with God. So when you speak the word of God, you have the privilege of doing that, you release God into your world. So he calls things, be not as though they are, and I want you to notice this. Now this is um, very quick kind of worldview stuff here. Look at Psalm chapter 11. And you'll see this played out here in a few more verses. Psalm 11. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. So where does God put his throne? In heaven. God sets up the headquarters of what will develop here in a moment of his kingdom in heaven, not on the earth. His throne is in heaven. So it creates this place called heaven and earth, both indivisible and visible, which are really important to our world. And he creates the world by calling things, be not as though they are. Then he speaks, and I always say this, 
He's not wasting his time by telling us over and over and over and over again that he spoke. He's trying to illustrate a sermon of how powerful it is when words come out of the mouth of God. And later, he's going to teach you how powerful it is when words, God's word, comes out of your mouth. Then verse 26. Then God said, let us, let us, let us. Now, he's illustrating something else here, and that is this. I used to think he's speaking to himself, but the more I looked at that verse, is he is actually speaking to his family on the earth. Angels, archangels, seraphim, cherubim, who are all fascinated by this creation of what he is creating, and that is called man. He's telling them, and so one of the principles you realize right away is God is invested in families. June 2020, Father's Day, woke up, was ministering with the first ministry uh, weekend after uh, the pandemic or pandemic, depending on your point of view. I got up that morning and God spoke to me. He said, here's six keys that must define the church. In the coming years. And the first one he told me, I'm not going to tell you all, but the first one he said is families and homes must be foundation for generational discipleship. And this is the first principle he established. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them, let them. Very key phrase right there to understand not everything, but it'll give you some understanding into the world that we live in. He doesn't say, let us. He says, let them. Let them. Let them. Let them. So who is he giving the world to? Humanity. Psalm 115, verse 15 and 16. The heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's. The heavens, even the heavens, are the Lord's. But the earth, he's given what? To the sons of men. Psalm 24. He's not giving, he's not giving the title deed of the earth. We, we, we know very clearly Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord. But, the, but, but since it's the Lord, he has the ability to give it to who he wants to. It's like this. Again, from my own life, the Lord gave me this understanding of this principle here. And it was this. He said, you know, remember when you lived in your parents' house? Oh, I remember. I had a room in my parents' house. And my parents said, this is your room. And when I got old enough to understand, this is your room. You are fully responsible for this room. You're responsible for cleaning this room. You're responsible for taking care of this room. If something goes wrong in this room, you will be responsible for it. The house was still my parents. That room was my responsibility to take care of. And if I told my mom, if things were out of place in my room, and I said, well, you're in control. I would have had a Pentecostal Spanish sandal come in my way why? Because it was not her responsibility anymore. It was her house and my dad's house, but it was my responsibility to take care of. He didn't say, let us. There's a common question, right? Asked all the time. We'll look at here in a minute. Good human question. How can you prove to me God exists? It's an indictment of believers, actually. Humanity in right relationship is to be proof that God exists. Let us, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over all the, over all the cattle. Notice he says it again, over all the earth. And every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created male and female. He created them. Again, you'll see also the foundations of healthy society. And when you read the Bible, you have an understanding why these things are attacked. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So let's, let's make some points that are really important for fundamentals. 
God's primary promise to man was not heaven, but the earth. Say that again. Really important. This is not a small statement right here. God's primary promise to man was the earth, not heaven. Really important. Because if you view reality a little different than God, then the vision for your life and how it's built will be off. You also see God, when he walked the earth, never promised anyone on the earth heaven. What what is the goal of God for your life? Here's another fundamental. The goal of God is for you to be like Jesus, not to get you to heaven. Ephesians 5, verse 3, this is where it gets quiet. Because if you repeat untruths over and over again, believers believe them. Heaven is important, don't get me wrong. But heaven has simply meant for a believer to be a consequence of becoming like him. Because if your life vision is simply to get to heaven, then you will make your choices based upon that foundation. But if your goal is to be like him, your number one focus is to be like him. Here's the other part. If your goal is simply to get to heaven, then often you will think what you're doing on here doesn't matter that much. But you'll be judged for what you do here. Here's the other part. A lot of people want to obey God to go to heaven, but they don't want to obey him here. The problem with that is, if you want to go there, no one's disobeying him there. Like, what are you, like, what are you going to say to him there? Like, it's just really inconvenient. This music is very loud right now. And <laughs> and don't think, this is an American concept. This is an American concept to live to do nothing with your life. That's why a lot of people want to go to heaven. They just think they're not going to do anything. No, you will be responsible for stewardship. And what you do not learn here, you will have to learn there. That's why a lot of people, they're going to need deliverance. Really? They're going to need deliverance and have to go to fundamental Bible college when they get to heaven. Because they're going to get to heaven and it's nice. And they're not getting a middle class home. They're getting a mansion. What are they getting? This ain't right. This ain't right. It's too much, Lord. We'll go to hell then, you know? Like, because <laughs> he's a prosperous God. <laughs> and when you really understand that, you realize prosperity has little, very little to do with God's not against stuff. There's a lot of evangelicals against stuff, but God's not. Get squired that. So God's primary promise to man was not heaven, but the earth. Here's another really important point. God never gave to humanity a religion called Christianity. God never gave to humanity a religion called Christianity. You only see that word Christian two times in scripture. And you know what it means. It goes back to the original point, and you'll see this. The original point is Christian was little Christ. That means they could see Christ in front of them. Do people see Christ in front of them when they see your life? So God, and God blesses them. Okay, here we go. Religion was created by the devil to keep humanity distracted from God's primary intent. Religion in all sorts of ways. And don't think you can escape being religious because it has to do with your mindset. So everyone is vulnerable to being religious. So are you a religious American Christian or are you a kingdom citizen? God gave to humanity responsibility for bringing heaven to earth. Humanity in right relationship was to prove the existence of God. And notice something else here too. Image. Image there, verse 26, is image, likeness, pattern. One translation of image is a shadow. To see Adam is to see a shadow of what God would look like on the earth. You'll notice to this, again, we're connecting what he began at the beginning of time and what he desired. Jesus, listen to me, Linda. 
Jesus was the first man since Adam to express God's original intent. Jesus was the first man since Adam to express God's original intent. How did Jesus live? Here's another powerful fundamental here. God gave him governing power for the earth. But he also gave him something else called choice. Really important. What did Jesus have? Choice. But he makes these amazing, it's almost these, these statements in tension. He tells Pilate, no one takes my life from me. He had a choice. You have a choice. You, there is a choice is actually more powerful than the movement of God in your life. You actually can choose. People are like, I want more. You can have as much as you want of them. He whom God has sent speaks the words. This is Jesus, John, Gospel of John. For God, for God, God, God does not give the spirit by measure. So you're the one who chooses your relationship with God. He holds you responsible for what you choose. Why? Because he's empowered you to do everything he's asked you to do. Later, he'll follow it up, Deuteronomy 30. See, I didn't, I didn't set this up this way. See, I have set before you. This is God. This is the way I set it up. Speaking to his covenant people. I have set before you life and death. I really want you to choose life. But you're the one who determines what you experience on this world. So he gives you the power of choice. So here's a fundamental question. I'm tie my shoes. It's drive me nuts. Fundamental question. Have you really taken responsibility for your life? Have you really? Because he says, work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation. Because here's a fundamental premise that you need to approach God with once you get born again. There are no victims in the kingdom of God. You lose all rights for victimhood. You could have experienced terrible things. Jesus. But also you'll see something else. God does not give rulership of man over other men. He gives them rulership over the earth. It's a big one. Man was created to be powerful. Man was created to fundamentally trust God. He could not rule the earth without God. But you lose responsi- you, 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 you lose the ability to be a victim. Now, this is very important. This is why you need revelation. Because in our culture, and in when, because difficult things can happen to us or challenging things that God never intended, you... You, there will be a subtle, often a subtle place in your heart where you will often, where, where in your thinking, where you will sometimes identify as a victim. Here's a common one. I work with people. 20 years. Here's what sometimes people say when, they're, when, they're, when they have marriage problems. Well, God chose my spouse. Now, that could be true. Like, could be like they could fill a witness. God's called them to do. But in the middle of their struggle, what are they saying? It's God's fault. I'm, see, I married this person, and they just, they want to sacrifice. What are they doing? They're blaming God for the problems in their marriage. And in America today, we know this. Might be preached to the choir. There is a whole culture where we celebrate the victimization of something. And I am all for finding the root cause of why people do things, repenting, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, you are your greatest gatekeeper. I mean, think about American culture, where someone who makes in the top 1% of wage earners in the world makes himself a victim Because there's probably somewhere in his mindset that he thinks he can advance his life by becoming a victim. I'm not saying victimization doesn't happen in America. I just say as believers, I refuse to let anyone define me by victimhood. So you have that choice. Here's 
Here's another point. We're almost sort of done here. All of humanity was given purpose and power over the earth, not power over human beings. Notice there, everyone's given a purpose. What is instinctive to humanity? Purpose. Everyone here has a purpose. Also, you'll see humanity was meant to govern the earth, not be defined by what happens in the earth. You're supposed to be like God. You're supposed to be calling things be not as though they are, not as they are. Because humanity was given so much purpose, I want to help you here. You see, most human disputes have to do with power in the earth. We just came out of a, I mean, you see it, you saw it constantly. It's very little to do with mass, no mass, all this. It was about the control and power of people. Climate change has nothing to do with, most of what you hear about climate change has nothing to do with climate change. It has about the control and the power of the populace. Because there is something in the image of God that they, they, they know they're supposed to control. So when it, here's another really key point. And this was just supposed to be my introduction here. There's not anything in the earth that the devil has ever created. There's not anything in the earth that the devil has created. Everything you see is a distortion of God's original intent. Music, the arts, media, everything you see, you were, to, you were created to be an original. Man's purpose could never be accomplished without faith in God. Notice too, this is important for Americans. You were never created to work for money. Say it again. You were never created to work for money. That's American. I, by the way, I'm not opposed to America. I'm just, we have to hit cultural things that are actually contrary to scripture. Most American believers even work for money. That's why they'll get mad at an offering and go to work the next day and work for money. Not knowing if they drop their offering in, they'll have way more than that job could ever provide. Because they work for money. What did Jesus talk about when he talked about the kingdom? He's, he's, he's Matthew 6. He goes, don't worry about what you can eat or what you can, you know, or how you're going to clothe yourself. But look... Listen to what he says. Look at the birds. They're not struggling. Question, what is a bird? A bird is a bird. <laughs> no, no, I'm not being funny. What does he do? He functions as a bird. So he lives from his purpose and he never worries about his, how his needs are going to be met. You focus on your purpose and you'll never worry about your needs being met. That's why understanding your purpose. But you'll never understand your purpose unless you put the kingdom of God first. Here's the other part. Humanity is not looking for a religion. The greatest hunger and pursuit of man is the kingdom of God. Everything you see, even I, I think probably democracy is probably the best version of government that we know for governing free people and according to Bill, as far as I can understand. But even democracy falls short in the, the greatest desire of man. The reason this is important is because most people, I don't know if you realize this, most people are not thinking about going to heaven. So for probably about 70 years maybe 80 in the church, we've been trying to communicate truth to people about a world that is not relevant to their everyday life. Would you like to go to heaven? 
I'm not really focused on heaven right now. I can't pay my bills, got my kids on drugs, I'm, this is going on. Their primary pursuit is purpose. They're trying to figure out their purpose. They're trying to maybe just make it meet. So if you talk to them about a world that is not relevant to them, you are not useful to them. You're only useful to the world when your primary pursuit is the kingdom and when you begin to understand that kingdom. So also when you understand your purpose, you understand also this fundamental premise. In God, there is no secular and there is no spiritual. So the word for worship in scripture, it's both in a service, but it's also the word for work. So when you discover your purpose, you realize that your work is a worship unto God. You realize that God is your source and now you are sent as an ambassador to that place to let your light shine before men that they may see your good works, not come to church with me, and they may glorify your Father who is in heaven. Since man, I'll close with this, sort of. Since man... Since man was created to trust God, the number one relationship for man on the earth is his connection with God. 